So thank you very much for this introduction and thank you for invitation. It's a great honor for me to be uh, here. And um, just for uh, the start, uh, some words about myself, uh, about my background, so, so why I talk about and why, why I talk about what I talk about and why I do what I do is that I'm a non-genetical geographer, meaning that uh, my first background is in sociology, second education and media and communication, then made postdoctoral research in computational social science, but most of the time I have been collaborating with uh, human geographers and uh, my research has focused on, on spatial mobilities. And um, to illustrate, to, so the main focus, what I uh, talk today in my talk is about that what we have also discussed today and yesterday is that there are the two mega trends, two big um, uh, transformational uh, processes. On the one hand, uh, there is mobility, like um, in its uh, diverse uh, forms uh, and variations, like including the forced uh, mobility, like migration, everyday mo mobility, and, and so, so on. The immobilities, hy hypermobilities, and so on. And on the other hand, we are talking about data, and more particular, data fication. So, so turning um, our everyday movements um, into uh, data uh, points. And this um, uh, kind of uh, intersections um, of data mobility, uh, on the one hand, give us uh, understanding and opportunity to understand uh, the big issues related to big questions like global environmental impact of various mobility modes. But it also raises big questions related not just to access to the data or data literacies, what are these, uh, these literacies and knowledge and skills needed in order to work with data, but on the other hand also raise the questions about frictions with the data, inequalities, fairness, justice and so on. So in this uh, conference, we have talked about uh, present and future, but to illustrate what this, uh, this mobility data justice actually means, I will uh, tell a personal story. A uh, personal story that uh, this example is from the past. And it is a story, let's, uh, it's a story of three generations, it's a story of different people, it's a story of uh, data and uh, mobility, and uh, these three people or generations, let's call them X, I, and Z. So on one hand, it's, um, it's a story of uh, a brave Estonian soldier who escaped from Estonia during Second World uh, War, or who who was forced to, forced to escape from Estonia. But it is also a story of um, second and third generation who, were, who experienced the control of information and also control of mobility and inability to, to, to contact and to meet this, uh, this brave Estonian soldier. So it's, it's also a story of information control and control of uh, mobilities. But it is also a um, story of social disruptions, inability to meet not just um, in a um, among the, the, the first and second generation, but also among um, the third generation. So it means this um, uh, historical example exemplifies that these uh, intersections of information and mobility, these are raising the questions of not just justice of mobility, but also justice of information and, um, and um, uh, data. So what is data justice? How do we understand uh, data justice? Uh, and spe specifically mobility data justice. So there is one uh, group of uh, research that has um, focused on mobility justice, um, like uh, the, um, the traditional geographical theories of Henry Lefebvre and, and David Harvey, who has said that besides this kind of market forces and commodification of space, we also need to turn attention to, to the humans, to the citizens, we need to give the citizens uh, uh, ability to design the, the, the cities, cities uh, themselves. And then later, the Karen Lucas um, and Anastasia, Anastasia Locatos Cedars uh, specified that this mobility data just, just is, it means, uh, uh, for example, just ways of planning the transport, um, so, so assure the, the accessibility to, to certain, certain points and infrastructure, or just ways of urban design. The second group of uh, research has focused on data justice, like the initial approaches of uh, Lina Tenchik and uh, Lina Taylor, who suggested to, to frame the, 
ways how we understand and work with data with the general questions of digital freedoms and, and digital uh, capabilities. And, uh, and also critical data studies that has, um, has, uh, are focusing on the negative consequences of, of data use, like data discrimination, col colonialism, and, and so on. And of course, also the, 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 the questions and frameworks related to vulnerabilities, so meaning that besides uh, this kind of general uh, frameworks like human rights uh, uh, need to assure and take into consideration the general human rights when we are uh, dealing with, with data and mobility, there are also discussions about about uh, vulnerabilities, so what, uh, what does it mean? Is it on the one hand, uh, some approaches have uh, understood it as, as belonging to social, uh, certain social category or other have, have said that it's, it's rather kind of universal um, universal um, uh, process, um, uh, meaning that we, we all are in, in, in one or another way belonging to, to certain, uh, certain vulnerabilities. Um, and later on, the, the discussions have rather said that, that no, actually, when we're talking about vulnerabilities, then it's kind of layered process, meaning that it depends on particular time and, uh, and space and particular situation uh, when we we, uh, we might be vulnerable to certain, certain data use or, or mobility, and th therefore we always need to develop certain skills to adjust with these uh, this, uh, potential uh, cases of uh, fund justice. So, what this mobility data justice is, what we're talking about, uh, then um, Barrett and Scheller has uh, proposed uh, that actually we should combine these approaches. On the one hand, mobility justice and data justice. And the framework, what they have proposed is that, uh, that when we are talking about mobility data justice, it's about the distribution. So, so meaning that on the one hand, uh, uh, how the data are accessed and, uh, and uh, how do you, do you make the data available and so on. Then on the other hand, these kind of procedural aspects like who, so these kind of who questions, who, uh, who owns the data and who, who designs the data solutions. And third, epistemic, so meaning that what is actually data and how to make sense and, uh, and how to make knowledge of this data. But what it actually means, so meaning that we still have the question, what are the principles of mobility data justice considering this high multiplicity and a variety of mo mobile experiences on the one hand, or how can mobility data justice be applied in the situations where not just uh, humans are um, moving, but also data are moving, data that carry also this important information about the human existence. And third, why it has been actually so difficult to initiate, implement and manifest the data justice principles within the mobility domain across um, uh, uh, societies and how to implement it into the practice. So the questions still are there as this cartoon also characterizes that, oh, what does it matter uh, if I post one more cat picture? So, so meaning that we are posting cat pictures and we are pro pro constantly providing the data and then we are very amazed that local government will take these cat pictures and based on these cat pictures, they design the city in the way that is not uh, appropriate for, for humans, but it's appropriate for, for cats, like, like just putting the boxes outside of the, the street. So it's, it's um, a cartoon shows this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, contradictions what we have with, uh, with the mobility and mobility data justice. So, how do I understand the mobility data justice? So, uh, pr uh, proposing this um, definition, it's, uh, the aim is not to, to uh, propose kind of alternatives, but, but rather kind of synergetic aspect. Uh, so, this uh, in this very long concept and definition. So actually what I would like to emphasize uh, is three things uh, that on the one hand to understand how to actually reach um, this mobility data justice is that instead of just looking at the consequences like negative consequences like data discrimination, colonialism or positive uh, consequences like efficiency and so on, we, uh, uh, there is um, I would suggest benefit of, of looking at these kind of uh, change processes that, that lead to, lead to, potentially lead to one or another uh, consequences, whether negative or positive. So, so seeing this data justice as, a, as an ongoing process of transformations. The second aspect, what I would emphasize is that when, uh, when 
understanding what this justice is and how it reaches. So we need to look on the one hand these kind of infrastructural conditions, meaning that what are these norms, reg regulations and data infrastructure itself, but we also need to look at these social interactions and processes processes, how would you, how would you, how would you share the data, who owns the, the data, so, so seeing this kind of complex, uh, uh, complex process. And another, and the third thing what I would like to emphasize is that uh, data is not a factor, but it is a construction, meaning that it carries the human information about humans, but on the other hand, uh, as we also have seen in, in our workshops and, and yesterday and, and, and today, it, it depends on the, on the perspective of, of the viewer, how we understand that the data. So therefore, therefore, this kind of interaction of the human experiences and the, and the infrastructure is, um, is important. <clears throat> so, uh, what does it actually mean? So, uh, so com very, 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 very complex, complicated definition. And I will illustrate this, uh, this understanding, how I understand um, uh, data, mo uh, mobility data justice using uh, three uh, uh, groups of research. So on one hand, uh, uh, what these infrastructure conditions mean, uh, what these social inter interactions mean, and what are these kind of new qualities, new potential qualities, how a just, just urban environment would uh, look like and what are these um, principles that we uh, could take into consideration when uh, we are developing data so solutions and would like to reach to data justice. So, the first uh, group of examples um, are about infrastructure conditions um, and access to the data, meaning that the way how we um, normally understand um, data justice uh, and mobility data justice is about how to, how to, on the one hand, access the data, how to use the data, but also how to make sense with this data, meaning that using, using mobility data for, for understanding the inequalities, inequalities in the, in the society and in, in urban, urban context. And one aspect, uh, what we have studied um, here is, um, and what these examples are about um, is, um, we have used the mobile phone uh, data with, uh, with colleagues from uh, Mobility Lab. And uh, then what we have analyzed, one aspect uh, what we have analyzed is uh, this kind of uh, generational or age differences uh, in, uh, in everyday, everyday uh, mobilities. I mean, and here, for example, what we have seen is that there is, uh, of course, uh, a decline of mobilities with, uh, with age, um, but also there is a high heterogeneity mobilities, me meaning, for example, that there is a certain delayed mobility among the older generation, uh, generational groups, uh, meaning that, uh, um, that there is an active uh, mobile group um, who, um, who have uh, uh, so-called delayed the mob mobility due to their uh, restrictions of uh, of, uh, of cross-border mobility, for example, during, uh, during uh, Soviet time. Or on the other hand, there is also a group of, uh, of uh, increasingly Im immobile uh, younger generation, for example. Or on the other hand, when we are looking at the mobile phone data, then we also have seen that the, the way how the data are, are um, structured and how the, the, the data function is that uh, the data are not networked and are also the, the way how people move, it's, it's also network process. So therefore another thing what we have analyzed is that, that um, uh, there is a link between the spatial distribution of individual social networks and, and spatial uh, mobilities. Uh, so, so here I presented the, the results and research what we have done with uh, together with uh, Olle, Siri and and Heineken, and especially in this network feature below, I most like this third group, type B, that is characterized by, by um, a quite focused mobility, but, uh, but distributed networks, meaning, uh, meaning that, uh, that female uh, participants who belong to this group, they are somehow compensating compensating through the, the calling activities, the, the limited spatial context. So what this example says that, um, uh, that on the one hand, the uh, 
data give us opportunities to understand and analyze this kind of inequalities, but uh, data itself also raise the, the question that uh, how to access to the data infrastructure and uh, what are the, the biases like. For example, what we also have seen with uh, mobile phone data is that there is under-representation of, of some groups like, for example, the, the, the younger age groups in, in, this, um, in this, uh, this, this data and also, also um, uh, there are also challenges with network data relations, meaning that we, it's not enough to, to, to ask the informed consent from the uh, direct study respondent, but, but the question is also, can we also, can we also and should we also ask the informed consent the, the, of the network partners of the respondent? So therefore, another thing what we have analyzed with uh, Siri, Holla and uh, Rain has been that we have raised the question, can we also uh, merge different databases and use different databases to, to better, to better uh, respond to these uh, limitations and, and analyze these inequalities? And one thing what we have done here is that we have merged the mobile phone and survey data. And uh, what we saw in this analysis, uh, that was um, about uh, spatial segregation of, um, of uh, Estonian and, uh, and uh, Russian speakers, and we started analyzing the activity spaces, and what we saw that, uh, that self-estimated social status rather than education and income are important factors in explaining uh, the, uh, the, the activity spaces and mobilities. Meaning that what we saw here, that the way how we understand e uh, Equality and inequality. There are no kind of uh, kind of uh, fixed or or very easily measurable um, variables or indicators for it. And then therefore, uh, what we saw that it's it's rather ethnic inequality in spatial behavior is rather linked to how individuals position themselves in the society, so related to, to kind of self-estimated uh, feelings. Third uh, project where we have studied this kind of inequalities um, is, um, is a micro mobility uh, project. Um, it was a bicification project uh, together with uh, Tallinn City. It was actually a comparative project where besides Tallinn City there participated also Praga from Portugal, Istanbul from, from Turkey and, and also uh, EIT. Uh, mobility was um, also uh, a partner and then what we made there uh, was that uh, the interest, main interest was to study the behavior change, meaning that uh, how to change people's behavior towards uh, using more sustainable modes of, um, of uh, transport like, uh, like micro-mobility and, uh, and bicycles, um, uh, more, more in particular in the urban context. And in principle what this project was about was that uh, the cyclist uh, uh, got uh, certain technical uh, tools, uh, tools equipped um, uh, to the, uh, the, the bicycles. Uh, and uh, then uh, initial aim was to recruit 500 uh, participants, but the final number was, uh, was uh, uh, smaller. And what we found in this uh, project that uh, uh, on the one hand, we were interested in uh, analyzing these uh, spatial connectivities and, and inequalities and how to, how, uh, how accessible this, uh, this ac active and, um, and micro-mobility modes are, how accessible uh, these, these are. And then we, uh, then on the other hand, what we were interested in was uh, to analyze uh, association with weather, because the, the question what in Estonia uh, immediately comes is that what are you talking about by cycling when we have this kind of weather? So therefore, what we made was that uh, on the one hand, uh, indeed, that was an um, analysis what we had done with, with Anniki, and then what we have found is that, of course, there is a linear association between the uh, weather and the cycling, meaning that, that the colder the weather, the, the less people cycle. But on the other hand, what we also have found that there are still kind of typologies, meaning that it depends, depends on some, some other, other factors. And what we also have seen in this, uh, in this um, data is um, that uh, there are also frequent leisure cyclists um, and uh, less frequent cyclists uh, whose uh, behavior, uh, whose cycling behavior is, is actually uh, somehow uh, somehow um, uh, more dependent on the weather conditions. And interesting result here was 
uh, this, uh, this frequent commute cyclist um, who actually, whose uh, cycling behavior was, was less uh, dependent on, on the weather, that actually also shows uh, since they are also more car owners and they are also those who can afford um, uh, real estate, for example, in, in some areas that, uh, that are also more, more expensive, for example, then, then it also shows that there are there are very clear inequalities related with, uh, with cycling, what also previous, previous research uh, has, uh, has shown, meaning that, that there, are, uh, there are also some, some certain groups with, with higher, higher income and so on who can afford, afford cycling, at least in, in Dalin and at least at, among this active, active group. Another thing what was interesting here was that this project did also combine the gamification and data donation uh, approach, meaning that uh, for every kilometer cycle, the, the participants also got vouchers, meaning that, uh, that the aim of this project was also to change the behavior, change the behavior of participants towards a more, more sustainable ways of, um, of uh, mobilities. But what was very interesting in this project was that it actually it didn't motivate people to do more, uh, more cycle uh, because uh, the group, group who participated in these studies, they were already very active, active cyclists. But what was interesting was that these uh, this incentives uh, and vouchers motivated people to donate the data, donate the, the quite sensitive, sensitive everyday mobility uh, uh, data for the, for the uh, local government to, to improve the, the infra, uh, cycling infrastructure and, and so, on, so on. And another thing what was interesting was that uh, in order to implement these kind of uh, projects, uh, there is a uh, uh, need to, to make function these collaboration networks on the one hand, and also on the other hand, there is need for, uh, need for a certain shift towards um, data culture uh, within the organizations um, implementing these kind of um, solutions. The second, uh, so these were um, one group of research um, that focused, um, focused um, on this kind of infrastructural uh, conditions uh, um, and data as a, as a knowledge maker, uh, knowledge making mean. And um, another group of research what we have here are focusing on the second aspect uh, when we think about the data, mobility data, data justice as on one hand uh, as a uh, process um, uh, that includes the, the data infrastructure, but on the other, other hand also proce process that includes the social interactions. And what we have done here is that it's, it's an example of a study, it's, it's also mobility, but, but it's forced mobility. It's, it's about, uh, about the refugees and their, their mobility. And in this, uh, this example is uh, about an algorithmic solution that was um, impl implemented um, in the case of uh, refugees. Uh, so initially it was uh, implemented in the US and then Switzerland, later also in several other countries. And in, in principle, what this uh, refugee relocation algorithm was about was that it uh, relies uh, on the matching algorithm, meaning that on the one hand, one hand uh, the profiles of particular uh, migrant was uh, analyzed, so, so like for example, what is the educational background and, and the job experiences and so on. And uh, on the other hand, it was compared with the profile and characteristics of partic partic particular region, region. So, so for example, what are the, 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 the employment needs and, and so, so on. And these were matched uh, together and the aim of this algorithmic solution was to increase the pro pro probability to get, to get a job and uh, by then to, uh, to, to, uh, to assure the economic e e efficiency in a country. And what the analysis also have shown is that, uh, of course, it, was, it has been very efficient, like, for example, when 40% uh, of cases uh, there was a higher probability to, to get a job in the US and 75% and, and in, in Switzerland. But on the other hand, what we also have analyzed is that this kind of solutions sometimes have difficulties to take into consideration the, the preferences of the re refugees. So, so therefore, uh, what, um, what these um, extracts from, from the interviews um, indicate here that yes, of course, on the one hand, it can help to, to find a job and, uh, and uh, to find a place where, where to find a job at all. But on the other hand, what the refugees also have uh, emphasized is that 
there are also sometimes difficulties to take into consideration the, the cultural aspects, like, like for example, uh, um, when the algorithm, for example, sends a huge number of refugees to one location, then it also might lead to, to spatial seg segregation, for example. And on the other hand, what we also saw in this analysis was that there, uh, there is importance of context, like for example, there are some contexts where this kind of algorithmic um, or database solutions uh, function quite, quite well, but also some contexts uh, where it doesn't function, like for example in Estonia when uh, it was about Syrian refugees, uh, where for example at this moment there was quite quite small number of, of um, Syrian refugees. And another thing what I would like to emphasize here is that when we are talking about uh, vulnerability and agency, so that is a discussion that we often uh, discuss about and what we also yesterday and today discussed about that who has agency when we're talking, for example, about uh, algorithmic and, and AI, AI solutions, uh, does the artificial intelligence have uh, has some agency? Then what we have found in this analysis is that besides uh, this kind of discussion, if the, if the data subjects or if, if the data solution itself has, has agency, then in this analysis we have saw, we, we saw that also third group of agencies is important. These are those who are developing actually these, these solutions, who are also uh, developing these solutions or implementing who are quite often are under this kind of pressure of, of making this a difficult, difficult um, uh, situation of uh, optimizing one or, uh, or another uh, indicator. So, uh, second study, what uh, we have done, that is actually a study of a PhD student of uh, Pauline uh, pa Baudens. Uh, and one uh, question that, that, that always, always raises when we talk about data justice is this, this kind of regional, regional uh, element and question about uh, global south and global north and, and so, uh, so on. And this study is an example of, um, of a woman and the role of digital tools in motivating the mobility decisions in a city of Pune in India. And um, uh, in this um, analysis, uh, what we have seen and what pa Pauline has, has, has seen is that uh, on the one hand, this kind of uh, mobile phone applications, of course, uh, this, uh, this makes the traveling, traveling uh, faster and, and more safe, um, especially so, so not just seeing women as a vulnerable group, but, but also this uh, study also included uh, those groups uh, who were rather advantaged, um, like for example, uh, those working in an in a IT sector and, and so, uh, so on. And what we, uh, what we have seen, what, what Pauline has seen in this study is that, of course, this data, there are data collected and analyzed via mobile phone, phone applications, uh, so uh, that uh, it sometimes uh, raises a, uh, feeling, feelings of surveillance and, and so on. But on the other hand, what this example emphasizes is that there is still these applications are significant enable for livable life and ensuring that the safety during tra travels. So, so this example shows that the, the ways how we understand the justice and how we understand the, the mobility, it, uh, it depends very much um, on the co uh, context. And third example, what is here? So it, it's actually not about movements of um, people, but it's about movements um, of, uh, of data. Uh, but I, and, and this example is um, about um, uh, health, healthcare fields, so I know that here is also someone doing, uh, doing analysis uh, and research uh, on intersection, intersections of mobility, mobility and space and geography and, and health. But what this example illustrates um, very uh, clearly is that uh, the movements um, of uh, people are or movements of data are quite um, often intertwined with the experiences of, of, of the humans, and, and actually the and therefore the the question what I what I have uh, uh, raised with, with these kind of uh, movements and uh, and the questions and processes is that maybe we also need kind of conceptual framework in order to understand these kind of movements in the ways like, like we also have uh, theories theories and conceptual frameworks to study the mobility and that also, also, uh, also migration, but also theories of uh, migration and mobility that uh, help, to, help to, to make empirical research and then also explain the empirical uh, research. So this example is about one mobile phone application, Upenva, that was designed in Canada based on data from Mexico, based on uh, baby cry data. And it was tested and implemented initially 
initially in Nigeria and later in other countries around the, the world. And uh, the aim of this application was to detect based on this uh, cry data um, uh, uh, deviations um, uh, from deviations in this, this cry data, and by then the the, the, the aim was to to uh, detect um, certain sicknesses um, and, and also prevent uh, the the infant death uh, death so, so birth as fixed, so that is one of the, the main main causes of infant death. So what it what it means and what well, what are the questions for what these kind of examples some um, raise is that uh, and what we also saw in, in our study is that what the what the what the participants or those who are developing and those who are using this kind of uh, uh, kind of solutions who say that data sources are unique to people and locations so it uh, it uh, shows that data are as a contextual setting setting meaning that there are some some situations where this kind of uh, relocation of movements of data is negotiable meaning that it's it's acceptable and it is trusted but there are also also kind of uh, examples where these kind of movements are not trusted and not not, um, not uh, negotiable and not um, uh, accepted. Um, so, so we have a lot of discussed also about trust, and that is also one uh, one of these uh, these uh, frameworks where this uh, this mobility uh, justice and data justice um, are coming to the picture. So third. Uh, so the this second second group of research was really about this kind of uh, relations. So what are these social relations? What are what are arising when when we're talking about uh, mobility justice and mobility data justice? And the third uh, group of research we uh, we have done and what I present here is about this. Uh, what I have called social elaborations, meaning that what are exactly these new qualities, or what what are these uh, these uh, these new forms of uh, mobility data ju data justice? So uh, what we can see in this uh, this combination and uh, and interactions with uh, with mobility and and data. And here uh, one of the inspiration inspirations what I have heard is the Henry Lefebvre's um, approach to rhythm analysis, what I think all of the geographers uh, know. But what was uh, for me inspirational here was that uh, what Lefebvre talks about is about that urban life is uh, structured by certain rhythms. Uh, and when we think about uh, the way how today our uh, spatial or or urban life is structured, then it's, it's, it's more and more structured and intertwined with, with data fight solutions and, and AI mediated solutions. So that is the, this kind of structure, structure, this kind of data infrastructure that structures our, our everyday experiences. And on the other hand, what Lefebvre says is that people process and adapt to, to structures. But the way how they, they adapt uh, to these, uh, these structures is that they are using all of the senses to perceive this roots, including also the, the, the cognitive senses, meaning that we, we, are, we are seeing, see, seeing we are experiences and so on, but we are also perceiving these, these changes. And therefore, the focus of research, what we are currently doing, so, so what I present here is, is, is a preliminary uh, uh, work, uh, not, not yet published. So one thing what we are doing here with our research group is that we are looking at how these cities are reproduced in AI area through measurement of cognitive perceptions, uh, biases and uh, shortcuts. And more, more in detail, what we are doing is that we are using um, cognitive methods um, like eye tracking um, and uh, combining it with a scenario method uh, where we are, for example, here looking at using um, autonomous um, vehicles um, as uh, one uh, proxy, one potential proxy to understand on the one hand that these kind of uh, perceptions, human perceptions uh, on uh, the on the AI-driven AI or AI-mediated cities. And on the other hand, what we were interested in here was that how this kind of uh, feelings of injustice and the feelings of um, neglecting or taking into co consideration of social di diversity um, in the cities uh, in the context of um, autonomous vehicles um, is, um, is perceived. And what we have uh, so what we what we have seen in this analysis is that uh, what we have analyzed is that on one hand the focus on social di diversity is how people are mentally involved. Uh, uh, 
to, to different social, social categories, uh, social, social groups. But on the other hand, we have also analyzed here together with a PhD student, uh, Mergime Ibrahimi, we have um, studied this kind of selective attention and cognitive filtering. So, so what are our implicit, implicit biases when we, are, when we are on the one hand uh, seeing this, uh, seeing and understanding these this scenarios and, and the main kind of underlying idea what we have is that uh, the way how we perceive this, uh, this kind of ways and understandings and norms and values are also, also embedded in the, in the development of, um, of AI solutions. And one thing what we have analyzed is, here is that uh, what Merkime has analyzed is that on the one hand, we are looking at different, um, different diversity categories, but one category that has been quite often neglected in, this, uh, in the studies of, uh, of mobility data justice is uh, disabilities. So it's a category that has been neglected. And uh, what we uh, have analyzed them here is that we, we have found that on one hand there are different, uh, different ways of, uh, of perceiving social diversities um, in the algorithmic cities like for example those who are, have rather balanced, balanced view, those who are rather neglecting, those who are, are uh, more positive, more, uh, more negative, but, but what, is, what is interesting um, interesting um, here is the most interesting is this, uh, this uh, middle, middle group uh, here uh, who are uh, neglecting uh, disability, uh, neglecting generally social, uh, social, uh, social categories in, in the algorithmic uh, decisions and, um, and the mobility in urban context, but foremost they are neglecting the, the, the disability group, meaning that it's, it's in, in, in some ways uh, um, some ways um, a vulnerable group in these uh, developments, but on the other hand, what we also saw that there are interdisciplinary there are disciplinary differences, like for example, those who are more neglecting this, this category in general, but also social diversities, or the computer scientists who are developing. So, so meaning that just this kind of, this kind of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary that is important for developing these, uh, these solutions. And besides what we have Analyzed here is that generally machine prejudice, um, and we have analyzed uh, associations with, for example, safety. We saw that this, this, um, this algorithmic uh, cities uh, and prejudices uh, uh, perceived in this algorithmic cities also decrease the feeling of safety in the in the cities. But, but also it also might lead to lower life satisfaction in, in the cities. Uh, but also also lower feeling of uh, of justice. So we have developed here or original scale of uh, on mobility data justice and data justice, and especially they are very critical in, in regard of equal equal access. And in and um, besides um, uh, what we are analyzing here, it is still work in process, so, so therefore uh, the, we, are, we are still um, finding the, the ways how to be better uh, measure uh, but also validate this cognitive engagement with uh, AI-enabled cities and mobilities. And here we have uh, developed a method where we are measuring it not just in an uh, in-lab setting but also in in online uh, setting uh, where we uh, have collected the data on uh, on this uh, algorithmic um, algorith algorithmic um, uh, cities um, and perceptions um, in 20 cities around the world uh, using uh, combining a crowdsource platform service with scenario method and and uh, online eye tracking methods but uh, still it's a work in pro progress and we will still need to uh, compare and analyze this accuracy uh, focus on aims, depth sample strategies that uh, different these groups and, uh, and therefore this example what I provided here uh, here the the feature right hand uh, uh, shows uh, quite long tails uh, uh, quite long long uh, uh, tails in these uh, perceptions uh, that, that means on the one hand that there is a huge difference across these uh, 20 cities are around the, the world depending on the on how diverse the cities are and what are the experiences with autonomous vehicles but it is um, still a question that we should um, analyze what it is and so what the question how do actually so when we know about what this infrastructure conditions are, how do you assure the inequality, how to analyze the quantity, but also on the other hand, 
when we analyze uh, these uh, elaborations, um, uh, cognitive perceptions, uh, and also relations, uh, then still one question that remains is uh, that uh, how to implement um, this mobility uh, data justice um, in practice. And of course, there are different, uh, on the one hand, frameworks, um, uh, guidelines, um, also ethical, ethical de decision aids where um, uh, data ethics decision aids uh, developed in Utrecht University, for example, is, is uh, one of the, the most, most used. And um, uh, but one framework, what we have proposed in Estonia, uh, is uh, published uh, within a book um, that is uh, the title in, uh, in English is How to Understand the Data Fight World, a Methodological Guide. And uh, there in this, uh, this uh, book, uh, in introduction, we have uh, proposed one uh, kind of framework that could be used when working with data, when working with AI solutions uh, uh, and making this decision how to actually, actually uh, assure how to actually use the data in a, in a just uh, way. And with uh, 40 experts um, who were working in this, uh, on this book, uh, many of them are also here, like, like Anto, Olle, uh, Siri. And uh, it's just one framework where we have seen that this local context is uh, important. But uh, of course, um, uh, although we, we have also called it uh, uh, like uh, uh, postulates or a student data manifesto, but still it is, it's, it's quite an open framework and we are happy, happy for, the, for the feedback if it, if it functions and how it functions in, in some other context. So postulate one and two in this framework. Uh, what we have seen in this uh, example is that datafication and, uh, and mobility and mobility data justice, it's a complex uh, process, it's a two-way social process, hierarchical, there are data relations are hi hierarchical, data hold controversial power, and also these relationships are uh, networked. What this cartoon here also indicates. Then second, uh, third and fourth, um, uh, data infrastructure is a public good. What we have done in our, um, what we have discussed about and deal with uh, in the open data uh, workshop with uh, PhD students and what we also have dealt in, with, in Estonia within the Info Technological Mobility Observatory. It's, it's a data platform uh, that we have developed uh, together with uh, different, uh, different working groups, uh, different, different departments, a uh, university uh, led by Mobility Lab, uh, lab in, in Tartu. And uh, in principle, it, it, uh, it merged different mobility data uh, under one platform and one, one cover to, to make, uh, to make the, the data accessible for different uh, stakeholder uh, stakeholder groups. And besides what we discussed about that ethics and justice are cornerstones of data uh, society. And if we don't follow the ethics, uh, then the results are, as the cartoon says, it seems that the reckless text mining has triggered another avalanche of first claiming yet another victim, terrible. Um, postulates five, six, and, uh, and seven. Context is the key. Data always requires interpretation. Interpretation should consider social cultural context. Then important thing uh, to emphasize is that data doesn't emerge on its own. So, so what we have discussed here, what these examples show that not data workers in a very broad meaning that not just those who are, are um, subjects um, or targets of these data solutions, but, but also those who are, who are developing and using this. Uh, uh, developing and using these um, uh, these solutions, um, and theory is not dead. So this kind of ethical, ethical and uh, data sharing questions, so what we are, what we are also facing. What this uh, this cartoon says that rate your childhood closeness with your mother on a scale of one to ten. Is it really necessary information for buying socks? And then postulate uh, eight, nine, and ten. Um, what these examples also showed that methodological pluralism is, is important, paradigm wars, wars are all open. So, so when we are collaborating, when we're doing interdisciplinary work, then we are more successful in assuring the mobility data uh, justice. And data worker is the main tool so that we always need not just to analyze, but also critically uh, reflect what these uh, potential consequences are. So it's, it's when we're doing field notes, uh, then it's not enough just to update Facebook status, uh, status uh, 
uh, it doesn't count, so we also have to make field, no, field work um, notes. So, conclusion. Uh, so, the way how I understand the mobility data justice, it's a um, uh, change. Change within the organization, change, uh, change, the, change in the ways how we understand the data, how we use, use the data. But there are always data and human experiences are tightly intertwined. Um, and then in order to understand what is, uh, what is needed in order to, to change the, the data practice, practices towards this more, more just, um, just, um, just ways, then we need to look on one hand structural conditions, but also social interactions and elaborations. And here we have proposed one potential framework to do Azure data, data justice, but of course there are also other potential frameworks. And then Coda, I also have happy end, end meaning that on the first slide, uh, the question arises, what happened with X, Y and Z? So it was happy end, meaning that this third generation, the, the cousins who were apart for 40 years, the final despite uh, there were some other disruptions like there was a COVID and they, they didn't have opportunity to meet, meet, but at least there was social media and they had, uh, there was information flow and uh, there, was, uh, there were platforms that they could use in order to get uh, information about each other. And after COVID, they, they, they met. So this uh, story of, of data justice and mobility justice had a happy end. So thank you so much. And one picture for the, the, the those who love cycling. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. We have time for one quick question, please. Thank you very much for the talk, uh, Alexander from University of Helsinki. And uh, my brief question is, uh, we know that data in uh, current modern or postmodern world is heavily commodified, it's a mm -hmm. commercial subject. So uh, how do companies and commercial sphere perceive the data manifesto how, or how to force them to follow it? Hmm. <laughs> Very good question. Thank you. So, so actually, um, with this, uh, this framework, um, it has been... Uh, very much used and very popular actually among uh, public sector. So, so both the, the, the local, local governments and, and also the, the, the ministries. So, so this, this book, it's, uh, uh, so, so normally when, when I present uh, this, this book, then, then I also say that, that the person who raises the hand uh, gets, gets the, the, the copy of the book. This time I, I save you from it, not just because of it's, it's an Estonian, but, but it's also 800 pages. And so when we made it, then we thought, we also thought that who, who reads it actually? But, but then surprisingly, it was, it turned out to be quite popular um, in, uh, in public sector, but in private sector, that's, a, that's the good question because the, the, the regulations is how they how they work and how they own the data and how they share the data. It's uh, it's a separate world. They have, uh, but it's I think a question for the for the for the discussion late, late, uh, later. So, but it's good good question. Do you, uh, do you, yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you once again.